All right, hello, welcome. We are not seeing tonight. Mark has uh, got his hands full, he's got a wife in Europe and a teenage daughter and a full-time job, and so he's not, not going to be here. I will not be singing because that is the best way for you to rejoice. I can assure you tonight. Uh, prayer list tonight, we had just a report from, you know, we, we did this thing on Sunday and Monday, kind of by the seat of our pants, and we opened up our parking lot, and uh, we had probably a dozen or more campers, I would say, ended up with probably around 20 at different times, um, both RVs and or people sleeping in their cars. Uh, we, had, we had families from... Washington State, Oregon, California, Nevada, Arizona, Pennsylvania, Montana, um, Florida, Alabama, South Carolina. Then we had several from Texas. So we fed most of them. We talked to almost all of them. I did. Uh, we were able to pass out tracks to all of them. They were they were asking what it would cost to stay in our parking lot. I said the the price of reading this track right here. That's what you're gonna. That's what you owe me. And um, it it went really well. It was very uh, calm. The only one that stayed all night was uh, Mr. Marcy over here. He didn't go to sleep till one o'clock because he drank an energy drink somewhere around nine. I think something like that. You can't you can't do that. Your your wife wasn't there. She wouldn't have let you do that. Huh? What was that? Yes. So I went home about 11, 11.30, and I met a guy at the service station going out, out of town. I live on that side of town. That last service station on the left hand, there was a guy just sitting there parked with his, filling his, car, his truck up with gas with an RV on the back. And I thought, 11.30 at night, he's, got, he's still got his RV. He's got nowhere to go. So I pulled around and went over there, and I said, hey, do you got a place to go? And he says, no, I don't, there's... I was told there would be a place, and he was a traveling musician. He was a karaoke guy, and he was setting up. He was having a stay in town because he was setting up over here at Wild Sea Farm uh, Monday night. And so I said, this is your blessed day. Because I'm the pastor. I'm, that's what they're calling me anyway. Over here at this church, Baptist Church, go over there and park. And he did. He wound up staying two nights so with us, so it was good. It was property was well used. We fed them mostly, um, gave them coffee talk to them, and uh, it was good. good. Good template maybe for a future event whenever we're soaked up around here. We ever hear, but we won't get another uh, eclipse, obviously, for a very long time, but other stuff happens around here. The, these kinds of things happen to us all the time on South Island. It was kind of like once a month for us. So it's sort of something I'm used to doing, but y'all may not be used to doing it. No one else was, apparently, because everybody else had their parking lots closed off. So we were the only ones with the exception of, not even Walmart did. Walmart no, had a no-go policy. Um, so with the exception of private places and those who charged quite a bit of money, we were the only ones um, otherwise. So it was really good. I'll have some slides up for you on Sunday, make a full report on that. Prayer requests. Our little Charlie's headed back today. She's home. She's headed home right now as we speak. She was released. She's doing fairly well. Uh, yesterday, I believe it was, uh, she ate an entire, in three, three sittings, she ate an entire breakfast taco. Uh, that's, I don't think it was chorizo and eggs or anything, but it was eggs and bacon or something. You know, not, that's not exactly your, you know, the first thing you take when, you're, when your stomach isn't settled. And, and, then, and then while and she's eating and having to eat small amounts and drinking, drink small amounts, but she is keeping that down. So that is, that is really awesome. We're very, very excited about that uh, for her. Uh, she is not fully taking her feeding tube, though. It's still, that's going into an area of a ton of inflammation and directly into that same spot where they did all this surgery. So um, they really didn't, the reason why they held her this long, partly because they did a massive surgery. The other part was because she just wasn't taking in a lot from her feeding tube, and because they haven't been able to count on her being able to eat by mouth. So, um, so 
they they went ahead and released her because they they think she's making good progress. So we're praising God for that. They have to turn around and go back to San Antonio tomorrow though for a doctor's appointment, which they were just happy to they're happy to be in their own bed tonight. So thankful uh, on behalf of the Zenners who none of them are here tonight. We're thankful to God for them and for how well uh, Charlie's doing. Katie Eckert's still on our list, but she's right over there doing better, aren't you, Kate? Happy for that. The first or uh, Jim Furster's uh, funeral is this memorial is this coming Saturday, not this coming Saturday, but the following Saturday, the twentieth. Um, that that's coming. Uh, Jack Lee, a member of our church, passed away two days ago. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you knew him. I only knew him in in the nursing home. Gone to see him. In, in my opinion, he was one of the healthier ones there, and then now he's one of the first ones that I've met to, to pass away. Um, Happy for him, sad for us for sure. Clara Fields, also Wayne Wayne Madral's uh, sister, passed away. Her funeral is going to be here uh, Saturday at two. Praying for that family. Anything else? Any adjustments that we need to make to our prayer list? Brooke, oh, is it not listed there? Her baby is due. She was here in the auditorium today, so already had the baby, already back at church, already picking up kids, like a machine. <laughs> Fifth child. So, something else. All right. And let's pray together, and we will, we will jump into our study. God, we lift our hearts to you. We are grateful for your grace every day. Grateful, God, that you watch over our lives in ways that we don't understand and can't see. We're grateful that you choose to use us for your mission, for your work, for your service. Lord, help us to find our place in that in every way. Help us to, to work hard at it. God, we're grateful for... Uh, successful event this past weekend, the eclipse and the beautiful things we were able to see, God, your power in the heavens and the opportunity we had to minister to people just through having the fact that we had a parking lot and we had the doors open and, and um, that was a privilege, God, we're grateful uh, for the blessing that that has and know that you're going to use that, Lord, in however which way you choose and so we're trusting that with you. Uh, we're grateful for our church. Thankful for this season, Lord, where we are and moving forward um, into the summer, Lord. We continue. We lift up to you our vacation Bible school that's coming, our two camps that are coming this summer. We ask God just your blessings over them. We ask God that you would move powerfully and work powerfully in the lives of these young people, drawing them to yourself. Um, we pray you continue to bless our services every single Sunday, every single Wednesday, God, that you would continue to work in our hearts and lives. Uh, making us into what you want us to be. We pray for our two search committees, for our music and for our youth search committees. We're just asking God continually for your leadership, for the right people to, to move forward, and uh, God, that you would continue to build our team here of leadership, uh, bringing us the exact right people. Um, we're thankful, God, for Charlie and that she is coming home. We're thankful that she's able to eat uh, some, and we pray that we continue and that she wouldn't have any more setbacks. Uh, we're thankful for the relief of the pain that she had been having for months now. Um, we just ask for a full recovery for her, God, uh, in every way. I thank you that we can be together over your word. We thank you for the revelation, God, that you chose to give to us. This is your decision, Lord, and we're blessed by it. Help us, God, to be open to what you have to say to us. Help us to hear your voice as you're speaking through this word of yours. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So chapter 7 of Revelation, we're graduating out of chapter 6, spent a couple, three weeks on that, and we're going to be stuck in chapter 7 for about the same amount of time, maybe maybe longer, maybe less, I don't know. We're going to see how fast you listen, and we're going to do that. So chapter 7, if you were with us last time, is a parenthesis in the process of the judgment. From chapter 4 on, basically all the way through 
to chapter 20, you basically are only covering, covering seven years. So it's very, very, very quick. Um, to, the, to the day, seven years, 360-day years, 30-day months, 12, 30-day months. Uh, you're co- covering only seven years, and so while there's a whole lot that's going to be cram-packed into that, it's kind of hard to, to piece it together in the sense of when it's going to happen. We are given an order here, but they seem to overlap in some ways, and we'll We'll look at some of that, and some of that we're just going to have to say, oh, well, we're not really sure. And some of it we're going to say, oh, yeah, we are sure. So what we can be sure of, we're going to be sure of. And what we can't know, we're going to say, hey, isn't it great to not know stuff and be okay with that? And that's um, settled. Like I said, if the Bible raises a question that the Bible doesn't answer, there's not an answer. Stop messing with it. You're not smart enough to figure out what God has hidden. So just leave it alone. Um, just, just a recommendation. Save you a lot of brain power, and you need all the brain power you can get if you're like me. So, chapter six concludes with the question with the sixth seal and a question that says, And who is able to stand? Chapter seven effectively is the answer to that question. Who is able to stand through this time when God is going to be judging these seven years? And that answer is going to be, uh, Well, there's going to be a bunch of people saved during this time. Maybe the biggest move possibly of God as far as bringing people into his kingdom. It's going to happen during the seven years. Uh, many, many consider that. Uh, you, I'll, I'll put the information in front of you, and we'll see how you feel about that when we get to it. So let's read chapter seven. It's not but seventeen verses, and then we will, uh, and then we will look into the the breakdown, if you will, of it. After this, it says, "I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth. Where are they? Holding back the four winds." Of the earth, so that no wind should blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun and having the seal of the living God. What's he going to do with that seal? You'll see. And he cried out with a loud voice, and the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. So now things have switched gears. So the, the six seals, the only things that were harmed were humanity. You had the Antichrist, then you had war, and then you had plague, and then you had famine, and then you had death, and Hades was falling right behind. Now things are shifting from humanity, of course, to, to the environment. Uh, the earth is going to be struck, the stars are going to be struck, the sun is going to be struck, the moon is going to be struck. Uh, of course, that, that'll kill a lot of people, as you can imagine. Uh, we are just—we just came off this incredible event that absolutely did nothing except for give us a nice view of of what happens when the moon passes in front of the sun. But imagine imagine the sun being permanently struck by one third. Remember when the thing had a little cookie bite out of it? Imagine that remaining. Uh, for your information, now that will not be resulting in global warming. You strike the sun, you don't get warmer; you get colder, really fast. You also get a lot more rain. You also get tidal effects and, anyway, all kinds of implications. We'll look at those things when we get to them. But, but so, so, so let's, let's just keep reading. We're not done. So do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees because they're going to do it. When the seals or when the trumpets start blowing, they're going to harm these things in a, in, a, in a categorical way. Until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their foreheads, who are they? He's going to show us. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel, much to the chagrin of any Jehovah's Witness. Because unless they're Jewish, Jehovah's Witness claimed to be the 144,000. And it's total knuckleheadedness and absolutely mishandling of the Scriptures in 100% of the way. And their, their, their leader, the guy who started Jehovah's Witnesses, rewrote the Bible anyway. They're not going by the original Bible. They rewrote it, cut out stuff added stuff in. The Revelation is going to speak to those who do stuff like that. I would not want to be him. He's already there, by the way. He died quite a long time ago. 144,000 the sons of Israel from the tribe of Judah, 12,000. How, tri- how many tribes are there? Are you sure? You're absolutely sure. I would suggest you shouldn't be sure about that, but let's keep reading. He's going to name 12 here, by the way. He's going to be leaving out two names, actually three names. Two tribes and three names are going to be left out here. Who are they? How how can I leave out two tribes and three names and still come out with 12? 
It's a good question, Pastor Bill. Yes, it is. So keep reading. So the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed from the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed from the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. It's very specific. These are not just in general Jews. These are very specific Jews. It's interesting, when you go to Israel today, they're able to genotype what tribe you're from. They can take your blood, take your gene, spin it out, however they do that. And they, they, have, they have anchored down which genotype of the tribes. They, especially, the first ones they did were, was the tribe of, of Levi. Uh, they pulled a big group of, of otherwise totally black people out of Africa who claimed to be of the tribe of Levi, and they ran their genotype. Guess what they found out? 100% Jewish. How can you be black and be Jewish? How can you be white and be Jewish? How can you be brown and be Jewish? You see, these, these color, skin colors have nothing to do with quote-unquote race. There's no such thing. Humanity is a race. Humanity is a race. There are no races otherwise. If your family lived in Africa for, I don't know, a thousand years and were exposed to the sun without sunscreen, those of you who survived this skin cancer turn into very dark people. If your family moved to Norway and needed no sun, and you got blue eyes and blonde hair and fair skin because if you had dark skin, you couldn't get vitamin D if you lived there very long. So it's about, it is about about the survival of the fittest to a certain degree, but it's about ad, ad, adaptation. I came from South Padre Island. Every, time I, every day I lived there, I got browner. I had not been that brown ever in my life because, well, you live near the equator, that's what happens. So that's an aside. Let's keep going. So these tribes, is Simeon, from the tribe of Simeon, Man I'm sorry, Chapter 6, verse 6, from the tribe of Asher, 12,000, from the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000, from the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000, from the tribe of Simeon, 12,000, from the tribe of Levi, 12,000, from the tribe of Issachar, 12,000, from the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000, from the tribe of Joseph, 12,000, from the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. This is exactly 12 tribes, but you've got two tribes that have been dropped out and a third name that's being used that isn't normally used as a tribal name. And we're going we're gonna to see that, but not this time. But just set it out there for you to think about and, 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 and also challenge you with the ability to prove that there's actually 12 tribes and not 13 tribes. So just try that. You won't win, I promise you, if you try to. You can do it, though. Try it and knock yourself out. After these things, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes, and peoples and tongues standing before the throne of God. So now we've had 144,000 Jews. Now we have these that are from not Jews. And it says, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues and standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, palm branches were in their hands, and they cried out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around. Now they're up in heaven. So what happened to them? Yeah, they're dead. So they've, they've paid for their faith in Jesus during this period by an execution. Because we're going to see that these are not sealed, but the other ones are. We're going to see that in just a second. But the 144,000 are sealed. They appear to be left on the earth, but these are not on the earth. They're not Jewish, and they're up there, and they got there by... Um, by not being alive anymore. Let's just say that. So, and all the angels were standing around the throne. Remember at the end of the fifth seal in the previous chapter, these that were the souls that were underneath the throne cried out to God, How long, O God, faithful and true, until you judge those who are who have hurt us, done these things to us? And he says, Not until he gives them the white robes, and not until the full number of you come in. Here's the full number. So many, 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 many more are killed. They're killed by just simply being there during that time period because, like I said, one quarter of the earth dies in the, after, the, after the six seals. And then here we're going to have, as we start these trumpets, we're going to see another third is going to be taken from the remainder, which gives you exactly half the world's population. It's going to be decimated in, seven, in less than seven years. So they crowd out with a loud voice, and we're down there all the way down in verse 12, saying, Amen, blessed and glory, blessing and glory, wisdom and thanksgiving. The angels are now saying this. And honor and power and might be to God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying to me, These who are clothed in white robes, who are they? And from where do they come? Remember, the ones underneath the altar were also clothed in white robes because they were also been given these white robes because they're waiting for their 
They still don't have bodies yet, so God's giving them this to pacify them until the end of these seven years. These who are they with the white robes who, who, have, uh, who were made washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb? That's a contradiction. If you ever got anything, any blood on anything white, you know it seems to be a contradiction in terms. He's not talking about a physical issue as much as it's talking about a spiritual issue. So for this reason, they are before the throne of God. And, oh, I, no, I'm sorry, I skipped over. Uh, these who are clothed in white robes, who are they and from where do they come? And I said to him, my Lord, you know. That's a good answer, by the way. Great answer. I don't know, but you do. All right. And he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. So mark it carefully. So this is not the church. They are believers. We only, when we hear the word believer, we always think of church. We always think the world revolves around church. We always think the saints are also the church. I'm not saying that they're not. I'm just saying there were saints before the church, and there will be saints after the church. There were those saved before the church, and there will be those saved after the church has been raptured. So we, we tend to only think of ourselves, and the church is just a small period of time, relatively speaking, into the whole, whole gamut of what all God's going to be doing. But during this time, there will be many saved. Technically speaking, they're not the church. The church was raptured before this. So these who, and, and, and it says, and, and they serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne shall spread his tabernacle over them, and they shall hunger no more. more. Apparently that was what was happening on earth for them. Neither thirst anymore, that was happening to them. Tough times. Neither shall the sun beat down on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb in the center of the throne shall be their shepherd and shall guide them to the springs of the water of life, and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Again, not that that doesn't apply to all those who are going to be in the presence of God, but very specifically this is applied to this group. They're a very, very special group that's set aside. They're saved during the tribulation. They're not Jewish. They're Gentile. They're of Gentile nations. There are countless numbers of them. Every tribe, nation, tongue, it says there. So it's all the way across the globe. And many of these are going to be paying with, for their faith with their life. because One, because it's an awful time to live. Lots of people are getting killed anyway. Two, because the Antichrist is going after them. He's going all the way after them. And there's nothing to stop him. God does not pull him in, does not rein him in. So uh, just by way of information there. So we, ha we have Revelation chapter 7. Uh, and it, again, it is the answer to the question, at least partially, back in chapter 6. Who shall stand? Well, here we are. They're standing before the throne, and they're also standing with these, these 144,000 are standing sealed. Uh, just by way of review, we talked about it last time, the organization of Revelation, uh, so we understand kind of where we are. Uh, as uh, has an inspired table of contents. Remember chapter 1, verse 19. We'll put it on the screen for you. Uh, God, Jesus taught, tells uh, John, write the things which you have seen. That's, if you will, the first chapter of organization. The things which are, that's the second chapter that runs us all the way through the end of chapter 3. And the things which will take place, the, remember the Greek word, metatauta, it's a single word, after these things. That's the way chapter 4 starts. So it, our chapter 4, again, Revelation just broke up into three parts. The things that have been, the things you have seen, the things which are, the things which will happen, metatauta, after these things. Most organized book in the Bible, to my knowledge. Uh, the future, that is, the things that happen after these things, metatauta, the future is broken up into three courses of seven. Seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls. The, inside the seven seals are the seven trumpets. Inside the seven trumpets are the seven bowls. Each seven is organized the same way. You get six, and then you get a, a break in which the, uh, the, sub, the Holy Spirit changes the subject and chases a necessary rabbit. That's where we are. Chapter 7 is a parenthesis between the sixth and the seventh seal. It's a break. We're getting the Holy Spirit is stopping the process. We've been boom, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six, before he goes to the seventh. He says, wait a minute, we need to talk about a few things. Here's what you need to know, 144,000 people being saved, standing before the throne losing their lives because of their faith. So chapter 7 is this parenthesis. Chapter 7 also opens for us, as you've seen, uh, this whole question of Israel and their part in God's plan in prophecy. It's a massive topic in your Bible, Old and New Testament. Israel's now reemerging, of course, in world events. It has already. 
having been absent nearly 2,000 years. Tell me what nation ceased to exist thousands of years ago and has now come back in. Do you know of even one? Now, also that nation that hasn't spoken their own language in almost that amount of time, and yet now they're speaking that language again, the same, the same language of the Old Testament. Where, where has that ever happened before? And, and not only are they back on their land, which is tiny, not only are there very few, like 9 million of them, but they happen to be a world power. In fact, they're one of the dominant nuclear powers in the world. You absolutely don't want, don't want to mess with them on many levels. But one of them is, is they, have, they can go completely nuclear, including, including ballistic missiles and, and in spades. And they're, they're not afraid to do it either. By the way, a lot of people don't know this, but if you'll go with this to Israel, you'll be listening to some of their history, and you'll find out stuff that you don't hear over here about what happened during the Yom Kippur War. The Yom Kippur War was their greatest, up until recently, was their greatest defeat. They're more recently, the killing of what it was, what, 1,300 people or whatever during this invasion of Hamas into Gaza. Uh, was that's now their greatest thing. But what happened during the Yom Kippur War was they were invaded. You know, they had, this has happened to them before, but during Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement, in which they turn off all their radios, turn off all their televisions, turn off all their public announcement systems, they were attacked from four different directions, north and south by four different countries, and uh, really got caught off guard and very, very much. They pride themselves greatly in their intelligence. Their intelligence basically said, we're safe, and boom, everybody went home to celebrate Yom Kippur, and whammo, they got hit really hard. The Egyptians uh, overran their positions. The, the, the um, Syrians overran their positions. They were just really, really in bad shape. Uh, Israel, uh, their response was is that they loaded up nuclear bombs on, on seven different tarmacs. And, of course, I mean, jet is running, fueled, ready to go, uh, headed to, to uh, Damascus and to Cairo and to Amman, Jordan, and to um, Baghdad. That's maybe not something you know, but you go ask them, and they'll tell you, no, that's exactly right. Remember the woman, Golda Meir? She was the premier. She ordered it. So we were, that was really close to a big nuclear event. That would have been really big talking about millions upon millions of people who have lost their lives. Had, they, had she said, thumbs up? They did not. They were waiting to see if the tide would turn, and it did. Gratefully, by God's grace, it did. And they wound up conquering, you know, all that, and you know the rest of the story. You just don't know the nuclear part of it, probably. But So how is it possible that a country that was nothing in 1947 is now one of the leading nuclear powers? The largest exporter of fruit in Europe is Israel. Um, they're, uh, you know, they're movers and shakers on so many different, on so many different levels. Uh, quite out of proportion to their size, their wealth, their importance geographically. Uh, it's becoming the center of attention. Jerusalem is small, uh, smaller than El Paso, about the, more or less the same size. You imagine El Paso being the center of the world events. Why? Why is Israel? I'm sorry. Why is Jerusalem in particular? Since it has no resources, since it has no harbor, since it has no airport, it's, it, it, it is the little bone caught in the throat of the world exactly like the Bible predicted that it would be. It has no, no other reason to be of any, of any value whatsoever. The, the reason, the value of Israel is its religiousness, the fact that it's the religious center. It is the religious center for Christians, the religious center for the Jews, and it's the religious center for, not the religious center for the Muslims, but is the most important religious site for the Muslims because they see themselves as the replacement of both the Jews and the Christians. This is part of their theology. You will not understand what they're doing unless you understand the way they think. That's what they think. God first chose Israel. He rejected them, dropped them, picked up the Christians. This is the way they think. When they sinned, he dropped them. He picked up the Muslims. The Muslims are God's chosen people. They prove that by owning the holy city, which, of course, they do not. And they haven't since 1967. So they either have to say that they're not God's chosen people, or they have to die proving that they are, which is guess what? Guess what's one they've chosen? And they will not stop doing this. There's not a, no such thing as land for peace for them. They don't care about. They're not afraid to die at all. Uh, they absolutely have no no concept of living 
uh, and putting up with the fact that proven that they're not God's chosen people. So anyway, so some misconceptions to deal with Israel's importance in our world today in, 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 biblical, uh, in the biblical world. Misconception number one is that Israel, since she rejected her Messiah, forfeited her promises. This has been very popular for centuries among humanity. Because they rejected and crucified the Messiah, they forfeited their promises. And the second one goes along with it, that the church replaced Israel as the receiver of those promises. This is also dominant theology among Christians for centuries and centuries, up until today. Uh, the church, the medieval church, was of course the Catholic church, but it wasn't called that. It was just called the church because there weren't any denominations. If you were, your parents or friends or anybody was, was Christian, they were Catholic. So the church, the medieval church, began to acquire wealth and property and marched on the Holy Land in three different crusades because of this theology. That's our land. We've inherited it. It was the Jews, and now the Jews have forfeited it. So they put together massive crusades, in fact, did successfully conquer the Promised Land on a couple of different occasions, I believe, and held different portions of it for extended periods of time. When you go with us to Israel, we'll see different areas where the, where the crusader castles, the crusader cities, you'll see in different cities, this is, a, this is a Muslim wall, this is a crusader wall, right behind it, they would build different ones, and they had certain technology, and you can tell the difference between, between the ones. So... Uh, the, the problem with thinking that Israel is forfeited and thinking that the church somehow has, has been the receiver of those promises that Israel forfeited is that the promises that God made to Israel are unconditional. So the only way we can use, lose a promise is if there was a conditional promise. And the promise that, promises that were made to Israel are not conditional. So, and, and also the book of Romans destroys this line of thinking. I'll give you just some excerpts from Romans here. Uh, Romans, this is Romans chapter 11. I say then, has God cast away his people? There's a question. You're going to get a direct answer. Certainly not. The word in Greek is meganoita. It's about as close to a cuss word as it can get without going over. Very, very forceful. Absolutely not. That's ridiculous, if you will. For I also am an Israelite. This is Paul, right? Writing to the Romans of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. Why would you say Israel's been rejected if I'm a Jew and a Christian? God has not cast away his people, whom he foreknew. Okay? So God's never going to learn anything. Never will, never has. He already knows those who are his. And therefore he can speak about the future of Israel as if it's already taken place, because as far as he's concerned, it has. We live in a time zone. We live in a in time is linear for us. It's not, not that, it doesn't work that way for God. For I do not desire, brethren, for I, that you should be ignorant. Remember, he's writing to Gentiles about the Jews. Lest you be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. There is a number, apparently. What is the fullness of the Gentiles? Well, it's all the ones that are going to be saved. So do I know what that number is? Do you know what that number is? No. Does God know what that number is? Of course he does. Whatever that is, until the fullness of the Gentiles come in, and then, and so, all Israel will be saved. What does that all mean? I don't know. Whatever that is, too. God knows that. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion. That's a particular mountain, central part of Israel, where Jerusalem is founded, right? And he will turn away in godliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. They very much were. The instigators of most of the persecution in the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, is Jews. Paul was all kinds of bad treatment he received because they were the instigators of it. Concerning the gospel, they are your enemies for your sake, but, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts of this is a powerful, powerful statement right here. For the gifts and the callings of God are irrevocable. In other words, God's chosen them, period. So, you got a problem with Jews, you just got yourself a problem. That's all i got to say. Because the, the, the callings and the gifts of God are literally, the Hebrew, the Greek says, are without repentance. In other words, you can repent of it, but God does not. He's not changing his mind about them. They are his. He will have them as his people. 
He will rule the world from Jerusalem with a Jewish king who is his son. This is going to happen. No, these things are not revocable. They are without repentance. Uh, again, the promises that God has made to the Jews are without, they're, they have, they're, they're one-sided, they're unilateral. So the results of this misconception, so that the Jews have forfeited their rights and their promises and that the church somehow has appropriated those or, or inherited those, have, tremendous, have had tremendous consequences over, this, over the centuries. They have left a trail of blood from Auschwitz, to, I mean, for, from Augustine to Auschwitz. The, the, ones who, the ones by far who have killed more Jews are the Christians, quote-unquote, and whilst the Muslims are pretty sad when it comes to killing Jews. They've, relatively speaking, they've killed very few. A thousand here, a thousand there. The Christians, on the other hand, quote unquote, Christians, I say that in large quotes, Christians have killed millions of Jews upon millions of Jews. The church's endeavor over the centuries to wrest the promises of Israel have filled many Jewish cemeteries. Uh, they led to the Holocaust. Nazis, Nazis were not Muslims, were they? Well, were they? They weren't Baptists, but they were Lutherans. They were Catholics. Just, I'm sorry. They were not Muslim. They were Christian, large quotes. They were Christians. Hitler quoted in Mein Kampf. This is what he says. I am only doing to the Jews, what the church has done to them for centuries. He was not lying. He was not. Ghetto, G-H-E-T-T-O, is an Italian word for where they, the church kept the Jews in Rome. The history of the church with regards to the Jews is atrocious. Again, we, we look at all the hate. We see all the Muslims that hate the Jews, and I already told you the reason why, because they occupy what they consider the most important city in the world. The Jews do. And yet in their, their endeavors to kill and exterminate the Jews have been, wow, they have done a very poor job. They should look at the, the, church, the church and Christians have killed far more, far more. So that aside, we need to consider why it's been, well, just, just, just simple facts of the way that the Jews have been treated ought to tell you that this is wrong. But more than anything, we need to consider the fact that these, un, of these unconditional covenants, and I want us to spend some time looking at them, because God makes three particular covenants with Israel, the Abrahamic, the Palestinian, and the Davidic covenants with Israel. These are unilateral covenants. They don't require anything from Israel whatsoever. If, they have, if they're Jewish, these are true for them. They don't have to do anything to keep them. They're only God saying that he's going to do this. I'm going to show you a couple on the screen, then we're going to look up one over here in uh, 2 Samuel. So Genesis chapter 12, we have what is called the Abrahamic covenant, one you're probably most familiar with. Notice the way it's stated. There's a lot of I wills, God speaking, none of the you wills. Bilateral is I will and then you will. I will and then you will. That's the, that's the, 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 the covenant Moses made with Israel. That's the Sinai covenant. That was bilateral. They definitely failed that one. But it's impossible, listen to me, impossible to fail or back out of a unilateral covenant once it's made, uh, unless the one side doesn't keep their side. But in this case, the, one, the only one who has a side to keep is God. And so it comes down to the very simple fact of if God is not a liar, then these are going to be true for Israel. If God is not faithful, then these will, if God is not faithful, then these will not be true for Israel. So first of all, the Abrahamic covenant, I will make you a great nation. Notice, nothing for them to do, just what God's going to do. I will bless you, nothing for them to do, just what God's going to do. I will make your name great, nothing for them to do, only what God's going to do. And you shall be a blessing, unilateral. I will bless those who bless you, unilateral. Notice, no conditions. I will curse those who curse you. Be careful what you say about those people. Be careful what you do. Be careful how you vote. Be careful about your opinion, about what happens in the Middle East. Be very careful. I would say that to our leaders, most especially. You're poking your finger in the eye of God when you mess with Israel. And you and all the families of the earth, and in you all the families of the earth are blessed. Have these not come true? They definitely have. 
Again, they are unilateral. They do not require Israel to do anything. This is an Abrahamic covenant. But he's also made a Palestinian covenant, which answers the question, does Israel actually own that land? The answer, very simply, is yes. Unilaterally, they do. It doesn't require them anything. Now, their occupation of the land is bilateral. Their occupation of the land is whether they obey God or not, whether they return to God or not. Their control of the land has everything that is bilateral, but unilateral whether they own the land. They just permanently own the land. They were not, they were not allowed to even to sell it among themselves. The land is their land, period. Just It is what it is. Genesis 12, this is the Palestinian covenant. Palestine, by the way, is, do you know what that word is? It's the Latin word for Philistine. And it was named, the land was named Palestine by the Romans because they were trying to offend the Jews in every way they possibly could. So even saying the word is sort of anti-Semitic. But we're going to call it that, the Palestinian covenant, because that's the way it's commonly known. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants I will give this land. Nothing for them to do. Just be his descendants. His descendant, then that land is yours, period. Unilateral. No conditions whatsoever. On the same day, this is chapter 15. So God's about to make a ratified covenant. He has Abraham take these different animals and cut them in the middle. And what, what happens generally in a covenant process is they would cut these animals in half. There would be Half of an ox on this side, half an ox on that side, half a bird on this side, half a bird on that side, half a lamb on this side. It's a bloody, bloody thing, but it's called cutting a covenant. They would cut them in half, and then when you made a bilateral covenant, you and I, as we, we would swear, now we have to go to lawyers and have them you know, ratified and have it sent and have it taken to the county and all this stuff. Back then, the way they did it is they cut these animals in half, and we walked together arm in arm through, through these dead animals, and at the, when we come out the other side, then it's, the, the covenant is now ratified. The picture is, is if I break my side of the covenant, the, what happened to these animals is going to happen to me. So pretty, pretty solid, if you will, signed in blood uh, in, in every way. So, so this is the process that they're in. Abraham divides these animals, and then God, instead of with Abraham passing between these animals, God himself and the and the, the imagery of this burning pot passes through. Abraham falls, is put, is put to sleep, and it, this God, God passes through these cut animals himself. He says, literally, if I don't keep my side of the covenant, then this is what's going to happen to me. Wow, what a statement. So listen to what he says. To your descendants, I have given this land. Notice the boundaries. These are not modern boundaries. They're not even, as far as Israel's occupation, They've only occupied this land. I mean, they've only controlled this land. They've never occupied it this much, but it's coming. To your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt, that's in the center of the Sinai Peninsula, to the great river, the river Euphrates. So notice, your whole, com whole statement of the West Bank and all that. Like, which river are you talking about? Because they own, by this covenant, the West Bank of the Euphrates, which includes most of Syria and all of Lebanon. Again, by unilateral covenant. Nothing they have to do to keep this. God has just said, this is yours, period. And then he names those who are living there currently, uh, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kadamites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephites, Rephaim, the, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Gershites, and Jebusites. So but just to give you an image, so this is an image on the screen there of Israel, the yellow part, modern Israel. Of course, the West Bank is listed up there. And again, Jordan is never in question as far as the possession of Israel. Israel, in biblical times, owned both sides of the Jordan. Today, they only own the west side of the Jordan, right? And not even all of that. But here's the, here's the description. So all the way to the Euphrates, you see the Euphrates up there in the northern part of Israel, Syria? So here's what biblical Israel is supposed to look like when they occupy it, all the way from the Wadi, Egypt, to the Euphrates River. So that's the West Bank that we're talking about there. So far more land, parts of Jordan, most of Syria, all of Lebanon, even though my graphic isn't the greatest there. So they did, they have controlled this much land under David and Solomon. They did control it. They did not occupy it. So they just dominated the peoples who lived in these areas. But if you look in Ezekiel, the, the land is reallocated to the 12 tribes. But I told you there wasn't 12. There's 13. So I have 12 tribes, but there's one tribe that doesn't get land. Which tribe is that? 
Huh? Levi's always left out. So how do I allot 12, 12 slots of land and still have one tribe left out if there's only 12 tribes? Again, I'm poking the bear. Make sure you know what you know. So God is, we'll, we'll get to, again, I'm just trying to make sure you come back next time. <laughs> uh, so so in, in, in that descriptive there of the allotment of land in Ezekiel, he starts at the Uriver Euphrates. He doesn't start at the top of, top of Israel. Let's go back to the graphic here. He doesn't, start, oops. he doesn't start where the yellow is. He starts where Aleppo is. And he starts striking off sections of land that belong to the 12 tribes all the way down, even though there's 13, all the way down to the center of the Sinai Peninsula because that's their land, just exactly like he says it was way back there in Genesis. He's not backing up on this stuff. Again, the callings and the gifts of God are irrevocable, without repentance. So, uh, so who, who, what's going on here? Who are these people, and why are they so important to God? Again, all these are one-sided, unilateral, unconditional covenants. Boils down simply to the question of, is God a liar? So if he's not, then all these things are going to be true for Israel. No one, even 150 years ago, commentators, good commentators, great solid men, Bible teachers, believed that Israel would ever return to the land. Almost none of them. Now, we had to, we had to rethink it in 1948. Uh, and we had to readjust ourselves. And always the adjustment I found interesting observing Christian doctrine, Christian Bible interpretation. Every time we've had to adjust, because God has done something we didn't think he would do, it has always been in the direction of literal. That is, we didn't think it was, but it turned out to be literal. Never in the other direction. So I'm of the opinion to let it say what it says, and if it turns out to be something else, then the second after it happens the other way, I'll tell you I was wrong. But before that, until then, let it say what it says. I think pretty much God says what he means, means what he says. Let him do that. So God will enforce these, if for no other reason, these covenants, than to prove that he is a God of truth. So now let's, let's look at our text. Verse 1, we're not going to get very far. I don't think I have another. Yeah, I do. Well, I didn't, we didn't read that one. So we, did, we, didn't, we didn't get all the way to the Davidic covenant. I left out the Davidic. So Abrahamic, Palestinian, now the Davidic covenant. Again, these are unilateral single-sided covenants. The Davidic covenant is 2 Samuel chapter 7. God comes to Nathan and tells Nathan to bring to David what God plans to do with his lineage. This is what he says, when your days are fulfilled, David, and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body. So why, is, why did Jesus have to be a descendant of David? That's the reason. And I will establish his kingdom, and I, he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne. Now, the problem is, of course, this sounds like it's speaking of Samuel. The problem is, is what it's saying, I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Uh, Samuel didn't do that. He did build a house, but, of course, it was a temporary house. Jesus came and has built a different house, has he not? Where is the house of God today? It's not this building. Where is it? It's right here. Who built it? Jesus did. Jesus has built a temple for God. We are the living stones of that temple. Jesus himself, right, is the cornerstone. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever, and I will be his father, and he will be my son. So you have this, the, again, the Davidic covenant. So these are just God, in all three of these covenants, Abrahamic, Palestinian, Davidic, it's only God saying, I will do this. I will, I will, I will. No, you will in any of it. None, none of that. There's none of the, no, no bilateralness in this. 100% unilateral. Totally dependent upon the faithfulness of God, which is totally depend, which is completely dependable. Chapter, now chapter 7, verse 1. Again, this is a parenthesis. It's inserted between chapter the 6th and the 7th seal. We end chapter 6 with the 6th seal. We begin chapter 8 with the 7th seal. The four corners there in verse 1 is simply a figure of speech. Nowhere does the Bible indicate, nor does the Bible seem to teach in any way that the earth is flat. For you flat earthers out there, I don't know where that idea is coming from. It is, has absolutely nothing to do with anything sensical whatsoever, and it's not biblical. 
tells us in Job that the earth is round. Where did he get that idea from? He says it more than once. Job? Yep. Job did. So, so yeah, the Bible doesn't teach a flat earth in any way. The winds of verse 1. So holding back the four winds of the earth, these winds are figurative, uh, implying the winds of judgment. Frequently used this way, Old Testament symbolism, you find this. Uh, these winds of, of things blowing. We're going to see those winds illustrated here in just a minute in the Old Testament. We're going to jump over there. The earth, sea, and the trees also can be taken symbolically. Now, they, they refer to things that are literal because we're going to see literal earth, little, little trees, uh, uh, literal, literal sea. We're going to see those being taken out and to a, by one-third in chapter, chapter 8. But also I want to highlight the fact that these things are used symbolically not just in Revelation, but also throughout Scripture, especially the Old Testament. They can be taken symbolically. Earth, symbolically, it refers idiomatically to the nation of Israel. Here's the reason. It, you'll find it throughout the, throughout the Bible. The reason why it refers idiomatically to Israel because they're the only people who were promised a chunk of land. No one else. Not the Americans, not the Italians, not the French not the Romans, not the Russians, not the Japanese. None of us were promised any land. Only The Jews have 100% guarantee of property. In fact, God names the, the dimensions of their property, lays out where they're going to be, lays out who the tribes are going to be, promises it, makes a unilateral covenant concerning it. God does none of this for any of the rest of us. So earth, if you will, used idiomatically, is refers to Israel. The sea or the water used idiomatically refers to Gentiles. Here we go. We have no land. We're on the water somewhere living in a houseboat, which I kind of like, honestly, but it won't be like that. But let me, let me give you some illustrations. So here's Daniel chapter 7 using this illustration of the Gentile, the sea of the Gentile peoples, if you will. Daniel has this vision he tells us about beginning in chapter 7. It says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of, in his head while on his bed. And when he wrote down the dream, then he wrote down the dream and, te and telling the main facts, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, behold, the four winds. Hello. Sounds like where we've been, right? So you're expected to know that. Holy Spirit just thinks you've got this like encyclopedia of the Bible running through your head all the time. Because he's already said this stuff, and now he's saying it again. You say, oh, that's talking about Daniel 7. Well, yep. Just got to know our Bibles. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. Again, these are not, not a literal sea in this case. And four great beasts came up from the sea, each having each different from one of these. And what turns out, these different ones represent these four Gentile nations that are going to rule over Israel. And we're going to get to those when we get to the study of the Daniel. We're going to get to that later on. But you're going to see that they also show up in Revelation chapter 12, and in, in particular back chapter 13. But let's go to chapter 12 in Revelation right now. So here's this great sea, the sea of Gentiles, if you will. And out of these sea of Gentiles arise these four dominant, world-dominating kingdoms. The last one's bigger than all of them. The last one has a phase one and a phase two. Also, its leader has a phase one and a phase two. He was alive and was supposedly killed, and he comes back again, and he comes back again. He's, he was bad before. He comes back super bad, if you will, if there's such a thing. So Revelation chapter 12, look down in verse, look verses 1 through 3. And a great sign appeared. So when the Bible set, says this is a sign, that means it's not literal. So there we get let off. Whew, I feel better. But we're not free to call something a sign when it's not called a sign in the Bible. Sorry, you're just not that smart. And I'm not either. And quit thinking that much about what's running around between your ears. It would be helpful for you and for me. A great sign, so we get, to, we get to call it a sign then. It's a sign. It's not literal. So, okay, this is not literal. A great sign appeared in the heavens, a woman clothed with the sun. So it's not a literal woman. It's a figurative woman. Who is she? The moon under her feet and on her head a crown of 12 stars. It's not Mary. It's not Mary. It's the Jews. We're going to get to what that is in, in a in Six or seven years, we get to chapter 11. So, I don't know. And she had a child. She was with child. And she cried out, being in labor and in pain of birth. Again, who gave birth to Jesus? It, yeah, Mary did in a strict sense, but this is figurative. We already told this isn't a literal lady. 
It's a figurative lady. It's the whole nation of Israel. Twelve stars represent the twelve tribes. But I already told you, there's not twelve, didn't I tell you that? There's always twelve in a list, but there's never twelve in totality. It's always thirteen. There's fourteen names. So, out of your Bible, you'll see that. And another sign appeared. Again, this isn't literal, so we know it's a sign, so we're free. And behold, a great red dragon, so having seven heads and ten hordes, and on his heads were seven diadems. Who is this? We're told this. We're going to be told down a little bit later. This dragon is none other than the devil himself, but this is not how the devil looks because we already told this is figurative. It's not how he looks. So, but it, it refers to how he operates and his, the realm of his power and stuff. So we're going to get to chapter 12 later. But our, our point is trying to, we're trying to get to the bottom of what the Gentiles are. And so this dragon now is waging war, and he tries to consume this child born of this woman, but he's un, the child is caught up to the throne of God. Now this child goes to the throne of God, so he's none other than the Son of God. Verse 13, skipping down. And when the dragon saw, so there was war in heaven, he was thrown out. Michael the archangel, along with all the angels who stayed with God, and the third of the angels get swept away. But the angels that do stay fight against the dragon and against those who went with him, and they are thrown out of heaven permanently. When the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Again, this is not Mary. This is the Jews. So if you want to understand why what's happening to the Jews, the way it has and the horrible stuff it is, there's your answer right there. So anytime you see persecution of the Jews and hatred toward the Jews and militant against the Jews, you know who the source of that is. It is always the devil. I don't care who's doing it. Anyone who speaks out against the Jews, anyone who fights against the Jews, anyone who wars against or tries to vote against or tries to stand against, you know who, what the entity is. There's a major controlling entity that's behind them. When the dragon saw that he was thrown down, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Again, these are figures. It was a figure of a woman. So, right, she's not literal. She's the whole nation of Israel. It's a figure of the devil. It's his... It's his regime and his minions and all those working through it with him. And the two wings of a great eagle were given to the woman. Again, this is figurative, but we're getting to something here. The wings of the great eagle were given to the woman in order that she might fly in the wilderness. That's always east for the Jews, always east, to her place where he, she was nourished for the times, time, and half a time. We know that from Daniel. That's three and a half years, exactly, 360 days in those years, from the presence of the serpent. And the serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth. Whoa, what is that? So we're, we're talking about figures here, so it's not real water. So what is when, when, when water is used, or when, when waters are used figuratively, what are they? They are Gentiles, people. So he pours, chasing Israel as they flee into the wilderness, he pours out a massive horde to chase them down. But watch what happens. Out of his mouth was uh, were the river that poured out of his mouth uh, after the woman so that he might cause her to be swept away with the flood. And the earth opened, uh, earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and drank up the river which the dragon poured out of its mouth. Ever refer to think of any other time where the earth opened up and swallowed up anybody? It's happened before. It's going to be in spades this time. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her offspring, with who, those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So now, skip into chapter 13, verses 1 through 3, even though we didn't read about the four beasts that came up, the four beasts are referred to here in the, in the, in the reverse order in this ultimate beast who's coming in the end times. And this beast is not just a person. In this case, it's both him and his regime. And it's hard to tell in many cases which one it's being spoken of. It's, it's, is it the regime or is it the person? Is it him or is it them? So it's kind of a hard, it's kind of a little hard course to steer. And I saw a beast coming up, notice where? Oh, wait, wait, first, verse 1 says, and he stood on the seashore, that is the dragon, and I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Woo, we already heard that in Daniel. We already know what that is. That's the sea of Gentiles. So now arises this one who is a Gentile, in this kingdom that is Gentile in nature, having ten horns and seven heads, and on his horns are ten diadems, and on these heads were blasphemous names, and the beast which I saw was a leopard, was like a leopard. That's one of the beasts in Daniel. And it was like had feet like a bear. Had, that's one of the beasts. And his mouth was like the mouth of a lion. That's one of the beasts. And he's the fourth one of the of the of the four in Daniel. 
And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain. His fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after him. And we're going to talk about more of what this is. But, but if, essentially, you have not just the resurrection of an individual from a seeming death. You also have the resurrection of an entire nation from seeming death. The one exception to the nations that have been eliminated and have returned, uh, other than Israel, is Rome. Rome has, in the biblical sense, a phase one and a phase two. She ceased to exist. She's going to be rebirthed. There's going to be a king who's going to rule over that and over the whole world, and he won't be a nice guy. We're going to get to that later, but just to uh, set you up for that uh, when we get there. So the sea refers to the Gentiles in many places. The earth refers to Israel, idiomatically speaking. Trees, biblically, idiomatically speaking, often refer to individuals. Let's turn to a couple places in the Old Testament. Psalm 1. Trees. How can trees refer to people? Well, I don't know, but that's what God does. So let it be what it is. Psalm 1. Great little pithy little chapter to memorize if you want to get a chapter underneath your belt. Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is all about the end times and about what we're talking about right now in Revelation. And I can't seem to get there, but I'm certain you know what it says, right? Blessed is he who does not stand in the way, no, what is it? Walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners, sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is upon the law of the Lord. He will, he will be, uh, his lies on the Lord, Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Notice what it says, you're down in verse 3. He will be like what? A tree planted. Streams of water is not the only place you find people referred to as trees, but here's one of them. Another place significantly so, and possibly more reference that we find in Revelation, is these trees often referred to world leaders. Daniel 4, let's go over there. So, by the way, uh, as an aside, Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, is going to be up there with us. So you're going to get to meet that guy. He winds up getting saved in the process of having Daniel as his uh, premier. And uh, here's part of his salvation experience. In fact, you could argue this is his testimony. Daniel chapter 4, here's this, again, this imagery of idiomatically trees referring to people, in particular leaders of people. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of all the peoples, uh, nations and men of every language that live on the earth, may your peace abound. So he's writing a letter, effectively, it's his testimony. It seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders of the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Sounds like a believer to me. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace, and I saw a dream, and it was made, made me fearful. And these fantasies, as I lay on my bed, and the visions in my mind kept alarming me, so I gave orders to bring into my presence the wise men of Babylon, but they might, that they might be, make known to me the interpretation of the dream. And Daniel's just a book of dreams, both Gentiles dreaming like Nebuchadnezzar and others, Daniel in particular. Then these magicians, these conjurers, these Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them, but they could not make it an interpretation known to me. But finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the vision of my dream which I have seen the visions of my dream which I have seen along with his interpretation. Now these were the visions in my mind as I lay on my bed. I looked and behold, there was a tree. Hmm. In the midst of the earth, the height was great, and the tree grew large, and behold, became strong, and its height reached to the sky, and it was visible to the ends of the whole earth, and its foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all, and the beasts of the field and the shade and, uh, found shade under it, and the birds of the sky dwelt in its branches, and all who lived all living creatures fed themselves from it. And I was 
looking in the visions in my mind, and I lay in my bed, and behold, an angelic watcher and holy one descended from heaven and shouted out and spoke and follows, chop down the tree, cut off its branches, strip off its foliage, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is a dream. He goes on to relay it, but uh, the interpretation that Daniel gives them, verse 19. Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, was appalled for a while while his thoughts alarmed him, and the king responded, Belteshazzar, do not let this dream or his interpretations alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to those who hate you and its interpretations to your adversaries, the tree that you saw, which was became large and grew strong, whose height reached to the sky, and was visible to all the earth, and whose foliage was beautiful, and its fruit abundant, and in which was, uh, was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the sky lodged it is you O king so there you have it so just being being aware of of the fact that it is used that way in the new testament uh in a particular when it's when it's being used figuratively idiomatically so we're going to stop there we have more a lot whole lot more to look at in in chapter seven but we'll give it we'll give it a break because i'm already past time so questions Lots of questions. Question? You're going to get a mic? Yeah, hang on. Oh, it's got an on over here, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. All right. I guess you're going to have to do it. I don't know. There you go. Who was it? Miss Spivig there. So the thinking that changed fairly recently, is that what dispensational theology is? What's that? The, the thinking that changed? The thinking that changed recently about how Israel will be a nation, it, This all is about Israel. Was that dispensational theology? Is that, yeah, is that what dispensational uh, theology Technically, is? no. Uh, dispensational theology existed before that. But there was dispensational theology, it's just they didn't take, again, they didn't have a dispensation that said Israel would go back to the land, which I don't, how can that be dispensational theology without it? So I hear what you're saying, but that, that, that line of thinking has always been there. The, 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 the thought, the concept that Israel had forfeited their rights was so pervasive in the church. Of course, it, it was originally a the Catholic thing, but then we were all Catholics, and then we broke off and became Lutherans and uh, uh, um, Baptist and Presbyterian, et cetera, et cetera. We all retained that same theology, though. We still retained the theology for a very long time. It was very pervasive in the church. So it was Protestant and Catholic. We all thought the same thing. Israel's not going to, has no place in the world anymore. Uh, again, the, the, uh, the Nazis were not, were not Muslim. Uh, this is a very strong, very powerful, very effective, influential theology that's gone. And it, again, the promoter of it has been the devil. Because very, I mean, at a, from a simple standpoint, it's just a misunderstanding of Scripture. And what's, what's he about? That. So it was one of, observably, it's one of his doctrines that he has really, really put a lot of money behind because it got him what he wanted, which was the destruction of the Jews because he hates everybody, but he really hates them. Because they are the object of God's choice. Not, not to say the church isn't also, but what Israel doesn't have that we have is that the church has the promise that the gates of Hades will not prevail against us. It doesn't mean you won't get killed. If you go over and, and you know witness for Christ in a place where it's harmful, it doesn't mean that at all. Many have given their lives for Christ, of course, for those reasons, and here we have the same example of people that are doing that. But... But Israel doesn't have the same promise. Israel has the promise that if they obey, then God will protect them. But the Christian, once we're of faith, trusting Christ, we're no longer in the realm of Satan anymore. The Jew has a separate sort of, you want to use the word dispensation. I, I don't like the term, honestly, dispensationalism. Because if I allow you to call me that, then immediately it puts you into a category of whatever you think it is. So I don't, like any, I don't like any terms at all whatsoever other than to say we believe the Bible because we automatically, we automatically have our own definitions of what those things are. So I don't like the word dispensation, even though if you call me that, I won't get mad. But in, you could argue that I, that I hold those positions. But there are some ways I dif, disagree with those guys or gals, whoever they may be. 
So, but the dispensational theology didn't originate then. That was your original question, right? It had been going on, but it wasn't full blown until then. But it had been going on for a very long time, because it is obvious that there were, if you if you will allow the term, dispensations with God dealt with Israel, dealt with the Christians, and then when the Christians are evaporate to heaven in the rapture, that he's going to go back to dealing with the Jews. That is very obvious. But but the 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 uh, the problem I have with disp- my understanding of dispensationalism, which is the reason why I don't want you call me that is because they say, well, there were times in which people were saved by some other means other than faith. That just simply is not true. So if God saves anyone, has ever saved anyone at any time, it has always been by grace through faith. No exceptions to that. There wasn't a dispensation in which someone was saved by making an animal sacrifice. No such thing. There were times in which that was a part of what their religion was, that was not the way they were saved. Always saved by grace through faith. God is being gracious because you place your faith. Abraham, before there was ever an Old Testament Sinaitic covenant, Abraham was reckoned, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. So there is no dispensation of faith, or, or I should say there has only been one dispensation, and that is faith by faith through grace. Heaven's going to be populated with people like that. No one who ever did anything other than that is going to be saved. Salvation is strictly the choice of God. It's strictly the work of God where he decides to pay for our sins. So those who who God accepted by grace through faith before Jesus, their sins were placed, if forgive this term, on a cosmic credit card until Jesus comes and pays the balance. He pays the balance of those who came before. He pays the balance of those who came after because now we look back to him in faith. The world before him looked forward to him in faith. Jesus says about Abraham, he saw my day and rejoiced. They tried to stone him for that. Abraham's up in heaven saying, you're right about that, Jesus, way to go, because because it is true. So I have a problem with dispensationalism because it seems to say that there were other, God saved people a different way other than by grace through faith. So I don't like that term for that reason. So, more answers to questions you weren't asking, but there you go. Something else. Brother Marcy, of course, I'm going to keep picking them because Terry said you needed to exercise. Oh, okay. <laughs> Across the auditorium. Is there a scripture that states that people who reject the gospel before the rapture will not be able to be saved during the tribulation? No. I'm not aware of it. I'm not aware I'm not aware of it. I guess my question would be if they reject the gospel, you know, do they get another chance? You know, is that is that a permanent rejection? Is that from their heart or or not, you know? Dale? Well, this is kind of hard to ask, but most of us all our life were taught Israel is God's chosen people. They were given the land. Yes. Okay. According to what you're saying here, um, we, I was always taught Israel, Israelites have to be saved. They have to take the grace just like we Absolutely. do. Absolutely. By grace, through faith. There's so no exceptions to that. Well, it leaves the question in my mind. They do have to accept Christ. They do. Just like we do. Yep. But then they they have the, the land, and they will not be destroyed, and Jesus will set his foot on exactly. Jerusalem. But they will be those who come to God by grace through faith. All Israel will be saved because they will be turned back to the Messiah, and they accept it. All, what does all mean? You know, God, not, does that mean every last Jew is going to be saved. I don't think we can read it that way because Paul is making the argument in the book of Romans where that is stated of those who were not, who do not believe, and they were hardened, therefore, judgmentally, so judiciously, and unable because of their rejection of the Messiah to turn back to the Messiah. So that's a permanent thing for them. So all, what does all mean? Well, again, like, like I said, we were there. It means whatever God decides it's going to mean, it'll make sense when we get there. But before, between now and then, it's, it, I, fall, I put it in the same category as the, 
fullness of the Gentiles. So how many is that? I got no idea. God knows both of those things. And there are going to be some large turning. Today there are Jews. We're having a Jew here on the 28th, by the way, get ready for her, Israeli Jew and her sister, who are going to be singing here in a concert on Sunday night of the 28th. They're going to be singing, giving testimony, and asking questions in a forum like this. It's going to be great. I think you'll love it. Uh, very much a Christian. Was raised. Both these girls, ladies, were raised in, as Christians in Indiana. They're both Jewish. One of them is now Israeli for 25 years. So Nebuchadnezzar was a Christian. What's that? Nebuchadnezzar was a Christian. I don't know if you can call him a Christian. He was definitely a believer. He b- b- believer, okay. Trusted God. I mean, he, like I said, he's making statements here of believers, even though he's a, from a very much a pagan to begin with. God takes him through a process of dream interpretation and of experience of, of, of the, you know, the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego experience, mm-hmm. and he slowly mm-hmm. comes to, and then he has this humbling experience here in chapter uh, four, chapter four of, of Daniel that, that brings him all the way. So just because they have the chosen land and not, no other person that God created has the chosen land, they still have to. They're, they're unique in that. Come they're guaranteed to, to be a people, and they're guaranteed to have a property, and no one else gives, gets those guarantees. But, to but get nonetheless, that. in order to be with God forever, they have, to have, they have to have placed their faith. That's what I thought. By having Jewish blood doesn't save them, not any more than the, that was the problem that the Pharisees had with Jesus. So what do you mean we're not saved? We're Jews. It's like, if you, were, if you were really saved, then you would know me because I come from the Father. He has this big conversation with him. Something else. All good, ready to go home? What's that? Amen? (laughs) All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for a good time we can have together over your word. Thank you that you teach us, God. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to pay attention. Help us to, to, um, help us to be careful with this word of yours, Lord, to let it say what it says and not make it into something anything other than what it says. And know, God, that you're going to be faithful to it, uh, just as it is written, it's going to be. So we thank you, God, that we can rest on that, trust in your faithfulness, God. It's because you are faithful to us that we uh, have a guarantee of salvation because of your faithfulness. So, Lord, we want to be faithful to you. We ask that, God, in Jesus' name. Amen.